Yes? Okay. <laughs> All right, so it's a pleasure to be here. So um, I'll talk about uh, cosmology, but uh, uh, mostly inflationary perturbation theory. Okay. So uh, all four lectures will be devoted to this topic. And uh, I'll assume that you know nothing about the subject. Uh, so sorry if it's going to be too basic in the beginning. Hopefully, towards the end, I can tell you some uh, more or less new things. But uh, the plan for this uh, first lecture is to uh, give you some elements, well, actually solve a, a problem of a quantum mechanics in a curved background. And uh, I, I mean that in a very broad way, as you'll see in a second, just to highlight the phenomenon of particle production, which is uh, crucial uh, in inflation. Okay? So I, I just want to do a toy calculation to show that it's kind of ubiquitous, this uh, particle production. And then I'll describe the arena uh, in which uh, inflation happens, which is, uh, roughly speaking, the Sitter space. So it's a, it's a very symmetric toy model of an inflationary background. So I'll spend some time describing that. And then I'll start uh, the theory of inflationary fluctuations. And I'll describe the calculation of the two-point function, which is actually the only thing that we have measured. But it's nice. We have actually measured it. And uh, if you uh, believe in inflation, then it's uh, already giving us some information about, about inflation. Unfortunately, it's not enough. Uh, so the rest of the lectures will be uh, about uh, going beyond this and then seeing more fine features of inflation, um, how to probe them, and what are the experimental prospects. I'm not an experimentalist, but I can quote some numbers, which is nice, some bounds, and so on. So we'll get to that. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So quantum field theory in curved space is a, is a huge subject. There is a textbooks written on, on this uh, subject. Um, I just want to highlight uh, two things about this which uh, are not the case in uh, standard particle physics in, in flat backgrounds. So the first thing is that the, the notion of vacuum can be ambiguous. So there's a vacuum ambiguity in general. It's not clear how to define the vacuum in a curved space. Um, and the other thing is that there's spontaneous particle production. All right, so, um, so the background itself can produce and absorb particles, okay, which is not the case in flat space. So in flat space, you need uh, to throw in some particles. And these, uh, you know, Feynman diagrams are essentially a, a picture of particles being produced and destroyed, but by other particles. Here, the background itself can uh, produce particles and absorb particles, which is an uh, interesting feature. So there are famous examples of, uh, of uh, uh, calculations in QFT in curved space. So let me just l list them. So the, I would say that the first nice example is that of, uh, does it always uh, scream? Uh, OK. can try a new one. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so the, probably the, the first example is that of a background electric field, which was uh, done, uh, it's more or less uh, as old as the quantum field theory. It was uh, originally done by uh, Euler, I like to say Euler first, but not the Euler you're thinking about, Euler and Heisenberg, so that would be interesting. Uh, so it was first done by Euler and Heisenberg, then uh, Weisskopf um, 
Salter, but it was, it's actually, this example is usually associated to the name of Schwinger. So, and uh, yeah, if you never read uh, his paper where he does this calculation of uh, particle production and background electric field, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's part of the reason why he got the Nobel Prize, so I recommend that you, uh, you read this paper. He does a lot of stuff. It's a tour de force kind of calculation. Um, then, of course, another famous example is that of uh, black holes. Usually associate the name of Stephen Hawking uh, to this example. And, uh, but the one I'll describe, and I would say the one that is closest to reality, is that we can, if we believe in this paradigm, we can actually probe this particle production is that of the sitter space. And, that, and here, there is just too many people. So a, a lot of authors have contributed to, to the theory of uh, the sitter space. So I'll mention them um, along the way. So let me illustrate this notion of vacuum ambiguity and particle production by a simple example. I'll just spend a few minutes doing this because I think it illustrates. And the example is a, a harmonic oscillator, as usual. but uh, with uh, a time-dependent mass. Okay? So I'm doing uh, uh, quantum mechanics, but using uh, quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions. So the Lagrangian uh, of this theory uh, is given by u dot squared. It depends only on t. This is a quantum field. And then uh, F. So by U of T, it, it, U of T here is playing the role of the background field. Okay, it's kind of like the electric field in which this uh, particle lives in, and, and uh, or the gravitational field, and so on. So U of T is given to you. It's a classical background. You can imagine that it's another quantum field. Uh, and the occupation number is very high, so you treat this guy as a classical background, and then this quantum field is in the vacuum or very close to the vacuum state in this background, okay? So let me just give you uh, an example. So here is just a plot of a sample U of t. So I want U of t to uh, go to a constant at early and late times. And then there's some uh, time dependence here. So there is, uh, early, at early times, and at late times, uh, the U of T switches on and off, okay? So uh, here, it really looks like a harmonic oscillator. Okay? That's, the, that's the point. So it's some sort of a, a, a safe area in which I know how to quantize the system. And then there is something that happens here in the middle. So I'll just call this omega squared, this asymptotic value. Uh, and then let's quantize this, this system here. So it's quadratic system. We can do canonical quantization. So let's see how this works. So I'll write Q of T, the operator Q of T, this form, Q classical A plus Q classical star A dagger. So just like you would quantize, uh, is this visible actually here? Uh, no? A bit lower. Okay. 
So uh, this is this is CL for classical. So I'm going to solve the classical equation of motion, uh, uh, then uh, pick a solution and, pr and put it in front of a, a annihilation operator, and it's complex conjugate because it's a real field in front of the creation operator. Okay. So the whole thing about vacuum, um, and then of course a dagger one. So the whole thing about uh, vacuum ambiguity is in how you pick the solution of the classical equation of motion. So the, the classical equation of motion is uh, Q double dot classical T plus U of T classical T equals to zero. Okay. So when we solve the, the harmonic oscillator, this is, uh, uh, of course, a, a constant, okay, it's just omega squared, and then the solutions are just uh, plane waves, uh, e to the i omega t, e to the minus i omega t. And um, the, the way that we pick um, the classical solution that is gonna go here um, in front of the A is by uh, imposing that the vacuum states minimizes the Hamiltonian. So that's the, the crucial thing that we do not have uh, uh, in our hands in general. So uh, the, the example of a, a harmonic oscillator, there is time translation symmetry of the action, and then uh, the Hamiltonian is conserved, and then I want to pick for the vacuum state, I want to pick the Q classical for which the Hamiltonian has uh, uh, the lowest possible value. Okay. So, so what, what's going on in this example? So you could uh, try to quantize, so we have to pick a Q classical and plug it in here. And uh, I, uh, one thing I forgot to say is that uh, we need to uh, properly normalize this uh, solution. So I need to impose I Q classical dot. I might be wrong by a sign, but something like this should work. So why do I need to impose this? No, it's a, uh, what's the basic uh, uh, thing of quantum mechanics? Canonical commutation relations. Okay, so to, to show that QP equals to uh, I, then uh, I should choose uh, Q classical uh, in such a way that this is satisfied. So if you, if you calculate the commutator between Q and P and use this uh, fact here, you'll see that the commutator is given by something like this. Okay. So this properly normalizes the mode functions. So for, um, for small t, uh, so in this region here, I could quantize the system like a harmonic oscillator, like say t, going to minus infinity. So then I could say Q, um, Q classical should be the solution that at early times as T goes to minus infinity should behave like this, e to the minus. This uh, factor here is just to uh, ensure that this condition is satisfied. The, the point is that it needs to be uh, uh, just a single frequency, okay? just e to the minus i omega t. In general, it will be a linear combination of e to the minus i omega t and e to the plus i omega t. But uh, if you want to quantize it like you would a harmonic oscillator, then let's say you're here at early times, and then I say, okay, here I know how to quantize the system, so I should pick the solution that behaves like this at early times. The problem is that if I do this, uh, then in general, when I go to uh, plus infinity, in which I also know how to quantize the system, then uh, this will happen. I'll get the linear combination of the two solutions. Okay. So I, I don't end up in a state that looks like the ground state of a harmonic oscillator. Okay. So. And this is the phenomenon of particle production. 
So I have two choices in this, uh, in this particular exercise. I could try to uh, impose that it behaves, the, the states that I'm choosing is like the standard vacuum state of a harmonic oscillator here at early times, or I could try to do the same thing here at late times. Okay, because this is early and late times, these are usually called in and out vacua. Okay? And the point is that they are different. They are totally different states. Um, so this is, the, this is the choice of classical solution that uh, is associated to the in state. So let me write this down here, in. And then the out solution will be the one that, as t goes to plus infinity, behaves like a single frequency. Okay. So Q um, out. Is defined. Sorry, such that um, Q classical, is this too low or fine? Classical out equals to plus infinity is e to the minus i omega t over root 2 omega, OK? So these are two different, so, so the, for the harmonic oscillator, once again, we don't have an ambiguity. There's a unique vacuum state. We have a Hamiltonian that is conserved. So energy is conserved. I minimize it. I pick a, a solution of the classical equations of motion. I'm done. Here, um, if I do it at early times in which I know how to quantize the system, I'll, I'll end up in a state that at late times, from the naive vacuum point of view, will look like a populated state. And as I'll show you in a second, it's actually infinitely populated. Um, so now, once I make this choice, then I can define the vacua, define in or out vacua um, by imposing that the A guy, so I'll have, depending on, which uh, mode function I choose, it will annihilate the in or out vacuum. Okay? So there is no actual vacuum. You have a, you have a choice. Okay? So, so depending on which choice you give, you, you, you make, you have a different uh, uh, annihilation operator associated with it. So it's just two different ways of organizing the Hilbert space. And there is no preferred one. Uh, one uh, thing to notice is that these guys here, so they are very famous. They are called uh, Bogolyubov coefficients. And uh, in a sense, the information about the U of t, whether it wiggles and, and uh, goes up or down, is contained in these uh, coefficients. At least a big part of the information. Uh, one thing is that uh, if, you, if you look at the, the behavior of a Q classical at late times and you know that it must satisfy this equation, it implies that these guys are not totally unconstrained. They satisfy an equation like this. So this is kind of a, a unitarity constraint. So the, the point is that in will not be simply related to out. Okay? And when we do quantum field theory in flat space and we uh, learn how to calculate scattering amplitudes and so on, uh, it's always true that in is not strictly equal to out, but it's almost equal to out in the sense in, so in, uh, in standard let me call Feynman perturbation theory. In 
and out are just related by some phase. Maybe it's a bad choice. Theta. So this phase is related to the sum of uh, uh, bubble diagrams in the vacuum. So when we do uh, Feynman perturbation theory, we throw away the bubble diagrams, but it's because uh, uh, the correlation functions, they have a, a, an in, in out factor in the denominator. And uh, so it's essentially canceling the contribution from the, from the bubble diagrams. So when we do Feynman perturbation theory, there's always this, uh, uh, hypothesis uh, in the back of your head. So when there is spontaneous particle production, you have to uh, use a slightly different formalism to calculate something physical. This? Is, sorry, what's the question? If, yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, so it follows. So if I want to impose that this is uh, true and uh, I use this expression for Q and P is Q dots and A and A dagger equals to one, then to, in order to satisfy this equation, this must be true. It's true that uh, for an arbitrary um, wave equation, it wouldn't be possible to impose this. The only reason why we can impose this is because the Vronskian is, con is conserved for this uh, type of equation, right? So if the equation had, say, a, a Q dot term or so on, then the Vronskian itself would not be conserved. So it's the only reason why I can impose this type of uh, canonical. Uh, the canonical commutation relations just imply that the Vronskian is a constant. Okay. Um, all right. So let me just give you a, Two equations uh, that relate uh, the, the in and out vacua to this Bogolyubov coefficients, and then I'll move on. So th I hope that this example illustrated that the notion of vacuum uh, is ambiguous when you have a, a background switched on. So let me just uh, show you, in uh, given alpha and beta that I calculated for a U of t, how the in and out states are related to each other. Um, so in this example, out states given by, so there's some normalization factor here that I'll get back to in a second, times, and this is the interesting thing, exponential minus beta star root to alpha. Dagger in squared in. So, the, so the out states from the point of view of the, of the Fox space generated by the in vacuum is infinitely populated. So I would like to say that this is a vacuum, but from the point of view of this guy, there is, it can have arbitrarily many particles. In it. So, and uh, the same thing happens on the other way. So the in vacuum looks infinitely populated from the point of view of the out vacuum. <coughs> by the way, why, why is there a square here? and not just a dagger in. Okay. So it's always pairs. See? There's no uh, uh, odd number of uh, particles. Can you tell me why you think that it's pairs only? Well, there's, there's a Q2 minus Q uh, symmetry of uh, this thing here, of this action, so you can't produce odd number of particles. They always come in pairs. Okay. So if you were to do a forced harmonic oscillator with a Q term here, then uh, that expression would be changed and uh, you, would have, you can actually have an odd number of particles also wouldn't be squared. Uh, finally, let me give you a slight physical interpretation of these uh, alpha and beta coefficients. I can't write here, right? It will, this thing will. Okay. So the overlap between in and out. 
So this is the amplitude for starting uh, life in the in states and ending life in the out states. Uh, so this amplitude in Feynman perturbation theory, because of that phase factor, is just one. So you, the idea is that you switch on and off the interactions, and then uh, you start from some uh, interacting vacuum in the past, and then you just get rotated to the same vacuum in the future. But here it's not the case, so there's a vacuum decay rate, and this vacuum decay rate is given by one over alpha, absolute value of alpha. And also the average number of particles, I hope I wrote this right, yes. Is given by this. So the, the number of operator of out particles in the ink state is given by beta squared. So on average you will see particles if you have a, a, a detector calibrated with respect to the out vacuum, in, the, in vacuum. So this is the physical interpretation of these two coefficients here. But we, we want to be using these coefficients later in the lectures. I just wanted to run this example to uh, showcase that when you have a curved background, the uh, notion of vacuum is a bit ambiguous and that you will, have, you will see particles being spontaneously produced. Okay? So that was the, that's the lesson that I want you to take from, the, from this first part. So I think that these lectures are all about probably the most spectacular example of particle creation, which is particle creation in the early universe. So you have spontaneous particle creation in this inflationary phase. These, uh, these uh, fluctuations, they get stretched out to like enormous length scales, and they actually seed the, um, the formation of structure in the universe. So the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background and the large scale structure of the universe, they're all formed by gravitational clustering, but you needed to have initial conditions in which the universe is not entirely homogeneous. You need to see this inhomogeneity somehow. And uh, the mechanism that inflation uh, uh, advocates for is that it's uh, quantum fluctuation. So you have a classical background that is entirely homogeneous, but quantum mechanics is always there, and the jitters of the background are responsible for seeding the fluctuations. And I think that this is an enormous achievement because the theory of inflation was not designed to solve this problem, but it solves it. Okay, so maybe it's a, it's a hint that it's on the right track. So, okay, before uh, I get into inflationary fluctuations, now I want to get to the second part of the lecture, which is describing uh, the Desitter and inflationary background solutions. So after I describe the background, almost everything else in the next uh, lectures will be about fluctuations on top of this background. So the, the, what's different in this case is that there is spontaneous, uh, spontaneous particle production. So the, the background uh, forms particles, and these particles don't just disappear at late times. They appear at late times. So that's the difference. Uh, so in a sense, uh, you, ha you are breaking the adiabatic theorem. So in the uh, Feynman perturbation theory, you switch on the interaction, and then the free vacuum slowly tracks the interaction vacuum. And then when you switch it off, it uh, slowly tracks back the, the free vacuum. They're related by rotation, okay? Uh, here, uh, you break the adiabatic theorem uh, through the background. So if you start with the vacuum, then you actually uh, start populating the naive vacuum with particles. And then you see that when you switch off the background, you think you're back in the vacuum, but you're actually in a state that can be as populated as you would like. So that's the difference. So we're gonna start in a state that looks like the vacuum, but then the background, we can borrow energy from the background, and this uh, uh, energy that is borrowed is producing these fluctuations that we see at the end of inflation. So that's the difference. Okay, any more questions? So now I want to describe uh, uh, the sitter space for you. Uh, because it's a string theory school, I expect that you're very familiar with anti-desitter space, 
but we actually live in the serious space, so it's important that we understand the not anti uh, guy. So let me describe to you a bit um, the sitter space. So there are many ways of uh, introducing it. Um, so let me just give you some slogans because it's useful to remind yourself how to think of it. So it's one slogan is that the sitter space is the Laurentian version of the sphere. Actually, as I'll show you in a little bit, it's also kind of a Laurentian version of the hyperboloid. So it's not a, there are many ways of getting the Sitter space. But I think that this is probably the, the most popular way of uh, explaining it. Uh, it's also the most symmetric solution of the Einstein equation, Einstein's equations with positive cosmological constants, okay? So, before I introduce coordinate systems, I want to describe it using an embedding, okay? So the, um, probably the simplest way of describing it is a, as, a, as a 4D manifold embedded in, in five-dimensional Minkowski space. So this is called embedding of DS. I will always work with 4D, okay, in Minkowski 5. And then uh, it would be just like the sphere up to a sign. So there is a sign difference. So it's a co-dimension one surface, so I, I specify one equation. And then, so this surface embedded in five-dimensional uh, Minkowski space is uh, called the Sitter space. And it looks like a hyperboloid, a one-sheeted hyperboloid like this. Uh, this RDS is also usually written like one over H squared. So H is the Hubble constant. So this is uh, the way that cosmologists think about this decider radius. It's also the radius here at the neck, so the minimal uh, sphere that uh, can sit inside of this uh, hyperboloid has radius RDS, okay? So the coordinate systems that we use for cosmology are uh, the ones in which we slice the sitter with uh, flat spatial slices. And the reason for that is because we expect inflation to uh, turn the, uh, our observable universe into like a, a tiny patch of the original inflationary surface. So it should wash out all curvatures. So people have uh, discussed inflation with uh, different slicings, but we expect that these effects are not really uh, important. So we'll describe the sitter in uh, flat slicing. And this should look familiar, I think, to people. You look like a, an FRW space with a particular choice of a scale factor. Oh. This is the line element. So there's a way of picking coordinates uh, relating this x naught, x1, x2, x3, and x4 to the uh, four coordinates that I'm writing here, dx squared. So there's a, this is called coordinate time.
And, and these are uh, called co-moving coordinates. So, but these are spatial coordinates. So it's a, there are three three-dimensional flat slices. These uh, slices will look like this in this picture. They actually don't cover the full hyperboloid, but we only care about the expanding part of the hyperboloid because inflation is not exactly the sitter, it's just a good approximation. So we, it doesn't look like it, but these are actually flat slices. So uh, at t going to minus infinity, there is a coordinate singularity. In pure de Sitter, it's really a coordinate singularity. It's uh, this uh, slice here. And then as t goes to plus infinity, then I move up. So it covers half of the hyperboloid. Uh, another way of writing these coordinates is by introducing conformal time. And uh, it's a small exercise to see what the redefinition of time coordinates is. But uh, given this H here, you, you get an H downstairs, okay? So this coordinate system with conformal time should look familiar uh, to ADS CFT people. Does it remind you of anything? This is uh, almost Euclidean ADS. So there is a connection to Euclidean ADS. You have to do double weak rotation, so Double rotation. So you rotate eta to i z and uh, h to, uh, let me get the factor r ads divided by i. So when I analytically continue the Hubble parameter and the coordinates eta, then I will get uh, the Euclidean ADS. Um, line elements. Sorry, say it again. Ah, yes, sorry. Uh, verse. Uh, 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 uh. I'm not sure that the factor is right. Yeah, ds squared is dz squared from here plus x squared. So h inverse is r squared minus 1. Yes. So this is uh, Euclidean ADS in Poincaré coordinates. Actually cover the full manifold. So this is actually a useful trick because uh, uh, you teach me how to pick the vacuum uh, in a, an ambiguous way for the sitter. Okay, um, DS has, uh, as I said, it's the most symmetric solution of the Einstein's equations. So it has 10 isometries just like flat space. Okay, so DS, 10 isometries. And uh, the reason why I wrote this form is because it's obvious from this form. It's just uh, rotations. Okay, so there uh, you can pick out of five, you can pick uh, two, every, any two of these guys and do a rotation. And uh, because one of them has flipped sign, you'll be SO41. So the group is SO41. That is actually the Euclidean conformal group. This is a useful piece of information if you want to think of something like DS CFT, which um, I'll describe a bit in the next lecture. So let's uh, quantize now the free scalar field in, the, in DS, because in the end, uh, uh, this calculation of the inflationary fluctuations will reduce to quantizing a free scalar field in quasi-DS. 
So this is an important exercise. So just free field theory, but now in this uh, background here. So the action is minus half. I'm using a minus plus 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 signature, so that's why there's a minus here. All right, so if we uh, quantize this, there will be, again, some uh, uh, problem with uh, defining the vacuum. But, uh, well, this is a Pandora box, how you define the vacuum in the sitter space. There is a kind of uh, agreed upon definition that I will use. Uh, and I will not say anything more about vacuum ambiguity in the sitter. And uh, if you want, you can ask me offline uh, what I think about it. Um, so the, the standard uh, vacuum definition is the one that we're going to use. So let me describe to you how we do that. So there is um, a little trick that people do. Uh, they define... Uh, some variable. This is just a, a trick to make the quantization a little bit more obvious. So you define V equals uh, 1 over H eta times phi. Okay. Um, this is called the Mukhanov Sasaki variable. And uh, then in terms of this variable V, the classical equation of motion will look like, well, maybe let me just write the action. So the action in terms of V is going to be a half integral d eta d3x d prime squared minus div squared. So, so far, so good. Uh, prime is just a derivative respect to conformal time. And then there you go. So first uh, interesting, well, one thing that I forgot to say um, is that while T here runs from minus to plus infinity, it's a real variable. Here, eta will run from, uh, when you do the transformation, you'll see that in order to map a real uh, time to eta, um, you just run over half of the real line. You'll run from minus infinity to zero. Okay. So eta going to zero is very late times, and eta going to minus infinity is very early times. Uh, another thing I forgot to uh, mention is that the Penrose diagram for the sitter is just a, a square like this. So we can just uh, do a conformal mapping that uh, squashes the infinite, uh, the infinite uh, uh, hyperboloid into a square. And then the flat slicing covers half of the sitter like this. And then uh, eta going to minus infinity is this slice here. And eta going to zero is this slice here. Um, so now if you stare at this uh, action using this Mukhanov sasaki fielder definition, then you notice that as eta goes to minus infinity, then uh, this will look just like a harmonic oscillator. You will shut off this term here, and then this will just look like a harmonic oscillator. I, I uh, have uh, spatial uh, isometries just by staring at these uh, line elements here. I have a, a spatial isometry, so I can talk about Fourier modes for the X components. So it's not like a standard uh, uh, Feynman diagrams in which I have four momenta. I'll have three momenta associated with these three spatial coordinates here. 
and then the time uh, variable, I'll, I'll leave it as is. So I work in a mixed representation. Uh, Fourier modes for position and then explicit uh, time dependence. So then uh, if I rewrite this in terms of Fourier modes, you just look like a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And then the prescription is just pick the vacuum that at early times behaves like a harmonic oscillator. The words that people put uh, around this, um, this choice is the following. So you imagine that, so here uh, the coordinates, if I track uh, a specific uh, distance in co-moving coordinates, it's being uh, expanded as time goes to the future, but it's being uh, uh, shrunk as time goes to the past. So if I go very early enough in time, as I take eta to minus infinity, then this uh, distance, this fixed distance in co-moving space is physically just a very, very short distance. So I should be, the field should behave as if it's a field in flat space. It doesn't feel that it's uh, in a curved background. So I should quantize it as I would quantize a field in a flat background. So this is the choice we're gonna make. Okay? And uh, you'll see that uh, because of the form of this uh, mass term, that in the future, I'll see particles. So that's... Yeah. But in the, in, in the theater, when, once we go to cosmology, uh, then this A of T will really have a big bang type of singularity oh, here. Okay. So. But actually in the sitter we also use this choice. But there are more ways, more formal ways of justifying it. You can, for example, go to the sphere, and then there the Green's functions are unique. Then you can analytically continue, and you see that if you were to do canonical quantization, you would get the same Green's functions as uh, with using this choice. The other thing is that for massive fields, this choice preserves the sitter isometries, which uh, might uh, be a, a good uh, uh, hint that you're on the right track. This is, uh, I would say that it's still disputed a little bit, this, uh, this choice. But uh, that, those are the standard arguments, and I think they're reasonable arguments. It's, okay. Um, Something else uh, from this action is that now, because uh, the sitter has a scale, the Hubble scale, it makes sense to talk about light and heavy particles. In flat space, you have only two options. The particle is massive or, or massless. There, there's no intrinsic uh, mass scale. But in the sitter, you do. You have the Hubble scale. So as we'll see, the representation theory in the sitter space is very different from the one in flat space. There's a notion of light particles, there's a notion of heavy particles, and there's actually very fine-tuned values of the mass in which magic happens, okay? So in this, uh, for the example of um, uh, scalar fields, uh, the cases m squared equals to two, h squared and uh, zero are special. So they have extra symmetry. The m squared equals zero just has a shift symmetry, which is special. The m squared equals two h squared is, is actually called conformally coupled scalar. It doesn't even feel that it's in the sitter space. It's, uh, it behaves as a field in flat space, as a, as a massless field in flat space. So these values are special. And then actually when you go to higher spins, uh, the story repeats itself. And then uh, as I'll show you later, uh, some very peculiar things can happen. So let me just uh, show you this in, um, let me show you this in, uh, so M over H. So the idea is that it's a kind of like, um, in these coordinates it's not obvious, but this mass term will be a bit like damping. So you have uh, the cases of zero uh, and um, square root of two are special. But then you have, uh, um, you have different mass ranges. So here, particles are heavy. 
I would say this is like overdamped region. So the fluctuations decay uh, at late times because of the stretching of space time. But here, as I go here uh, to lighter uh, values of the mass, the, the amplitudes are actually not over them. They're not uh, super um, red shifted. So actually we'll be interested in this region here, very light, close to zero mass. And here the amplitudes will survive at late times. So what happens is that if you study the, the, the solutions of the wave equation, you'll see that when the mass is much bigger than Hubble, uh, if you, even if you start with vacuum-like uh, solutions at early times, at late times they're getting damped. So the amplitudes are actually going to zero uh, at late times. But as I go to lighter and lighter masses, the amplitudes actually survive at late times. So that's the reason why, um, why inflation works, because there are some light fields floating around during inflation, and then um, their particles are produced, and they are red-shifted. It's important that they're red-shifted because they will seed the formation of structure in the universe. But it's also important that the amplitudes survive. They don't, uh, get, uh, they don't decay at late times. Uh, let me make this a little bit clearer. So the sol yeah. You can at the free field theory level, it's possible, but you have the usual problems with tachyons. The amplitude actually blows up at late times. And yeah, it looks tachyonic, right, for m squared less than... Uh, Yeah, it looks tachyonic, yeah. But uh, the reason why you're, you're uh, not in trouble is because this uh, mass term is also becoming infinitely heavy. So that's, there's, there's some um, com competition between this genes type of instability and the stretching of space time. So something survives that is not uh, just tachyonic instability. Um, so let me write down the solution so the so again, I have to quantize this field, and the solution um, dk of eta. So again, I have uh, uh, spatial translations, so I can talk about Fourier mode. So I'll quantize each Fourier mode like a harmonic oscillator, as I would in, uh, in uh, QFT in Minkowski space. But now I have to pick the solution that at early times will behave like a standard harmonic oscillator. Uh, so the solution VK classical that agrees with a, a harmonic oscillator at early times is, it's actually a Hunkel function, so it's not very illuminating. So I don't know if I even write it for you. Okay, I'll write it. VK, is it visible here? Yeah. VK of eta. So I'm, I'm gonna put all the details, but it's just once. To the I to nu plus one times pi over four times Hunkel function. So there are two types of Hunkel function. This is type one of Hunkel function minus. It's just some solution of the Bessel equation. Uh, K is the, is the wave number, and eta is conformal time. And this new index here is related to the mass, um, to the mass of the field, like this new squared is nine quarters minus m squared over h squared, okay? Actually, we'll only be interested in the massless case at the end of the day, but I, I want you to see this so you see the difference between massive and light fields in ds. So at late times, when I go to eta going to zero, 
So as zeta goes to zero, then VK of eta, uh, and I'm assuming that M over H is much bigger than one. So I'm, I'm looking at the overdamped region for the moment. Then uh, you will behave like this, minus eta, the one half, to the I M over H, C1 plus C2 eta to the minus I M over H, okay? So, you, so there will be a decaying part. So you see it's actually going to zero. The amplitude is this red shifting that I, I was talking about. Um, and then there will be two pieces uh, and this should remind you of the e to the i omega t and e to the minus i omega t, okay? And these coefficients are really related to particle production. The problem here is that the sitter space, the background never switches off, so you need to cheat a little bit. You have to switch off the background and be again in flat space to have a nice interpretation of these things as Bogolyubov coefficients. And then you can count how many particles you have at late times. Um, so this can be done, uh, and, and also notice that uh, if I go back, once again, this is a little bit of cheating, but if I go back to uh, coordinate time, then this will really look like e to the i m t c1 plus c2 e to the minus i m t, okay? Because eta is like e to the minus h t or something like that. So um, then it really looks like a harmonic oscillator at late times. And then you can interpret these coefficients as Bogolyubov coefficients. Um, so there is particle production, but uh, the amplitude is actually uh, going to zero at late times. The interesting thing happens for uh, massless fields. So for, for massless fields, And this is the case we'll be interested. Vk of eta equals one over root two k one minus over k eta. Okay. Uh, re recall that uh, Vk is um, is actually uh, a fielder definition from the standard field. There is that one over H eta there, Muhanov Sasaki. So if I actually go back to the field in, uh, in the sitter space, the original definition, so phi k of eta is just a factor difference in here. You will look like, um, I think it should look like this. One. If I didn't make a mistake, it should look like this. And now you see that as you go to, to late times, as eta goes to zero, it actually goes to a constant. And this is remarkable, okay? So there is uh, some late time amplitude. So there is this tachyonic instability that was pointed out, but there's also the expansion of space time. And somehow these, co these uh, effects kind of uh, compete with each other and what you have left is, is some amplitude uh, for the field at uh, momentum k. Okay? And it goes, it depends on the momentum like this. And it's more or less this formula and a little bit of peppering on top of it that gives the power spectrum for the inflationary fluctuations, okay? Huh? Uh, yeah, so 
the signs should be opposite here. Maybe I made a mistake uh, here, uh, or maybe the definition has a minus sign. This is correct. <laughs> so this is, this is correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, the minus sign is important because if I expand this, this minus i k eta has to cancel with this plus i k eta. So the first uh, uh, no, no subleading contribution should go like eta squared. So that's the consistency check. Okay, uh, I have a minus one minute, is that right? Uh, yeah, okay, so I'm actually almost done, but because this is really important, maybe I'll do it uh, after lunch. So after lunch, I'll, I'll explain how inflation modifies, the, the, is a little bit of modification of the dynamics of the sitter, and then uh, we'll redo this calculation of the fluctuations, but in the inflationary background.